Jesus, en Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, praise God for the son of David. But the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. Haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say, you have taught children and infants to give you praise. Then he returned to Bethany where he stayed overnight. Well, good morning. Hey, if it's your first time with us, we are so glad you've uh, chosen to be here with us. Uh, and for whatever reason you're here, sometimes people are here because they got invited. Sometimes they're home for a vacation or a quick weekend and their family comes here and so they got invited. Maybe got promised lunch. You know, maybe she's just really cute and she was going to be here today, so you're here today. But whatever the reason, we're glad you're here. We're actually kicked off a brand new message series last week, looking at the very last week uh, of Jesus' life before he was crucified, before he was resurrected. We call it the Easter week, uh, the whole week leading up to it. And so if you're not real familiar with it, that's kind of where we're at, and uh, you can read about it later in the Bible. But today we're on, actually on day uh, Monday of that week. Last week we looked at Sunday. Today it's Monday. And as you heard, Jesus went to the temple that morning, and the temple's this, we, we sometimes don't quite understand it. It, it was a huge, huge complex. And it was a bunch of different things. And it wasn't, you know, if you're familiar at all with the Bible, you may think Old Testament. You may think of the, the, the one that was out in the desert, the wilderness, when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt and this little, this holy place and this most holy place and this small thing. But this was, this was a much grander temple. And it wasn't Solomon's temple. This was the, the second temple. It was not quite as grand as Solomon's, but it was still huge. Somebody said, I was reading this week, 16 acres this area that Jesus entered co covered. It was called the, the Gate of the Gentiles because this is a place where Gentiles could come, but they could not go any closer. And it, for women, they had a gate for you ladies, by the way, women's gate. That's because they wanted to keep you separate from the men because you never knew what happens when men and women get a chance to sit around each other, right? They had the gate for the priest because, hey, us priests like to have just a little bit of space between us and all you people, all right? And so that's the, the scenario. Jesus enters this, this big area of the Gentiles, and it's just crazy. There, scholars tell us there was between 800 and 2 million people that were packed into this, town, this place of Jerusalem because they had come for Passover. And Passover was this huge, long, it, it, is, the, it is the biggest celebration in the Jewish calendar because it, it's a part when they remind themselves that God did something for us, not just our ancestors, but for us. He has brought us out of slavery. He broke those bonds. He gave us a chance to go to the promised land to live. And so it was a celebration that every male over the age of 12 was expected to make the journey to Jerusalem to be there. So there was a lot of testosterone rolling around those streets. And it was crazy. If you were here last Saturday night, that wasn't even close to how crazy it would have been there because it was just people everywhere and people buying and selling this whole crazy scene. As Jesus enters it, he looks around, and it's one of the few times that we see Jesus ticked off. You know, when you think of Jesus, you think of Jesus, this kind, caring, compassionate. And he is, and was. But it was also those moments when he got just a little ticked off. And this is the second time he's come to the temple. We're told about three years before this, he's come to the temple, did a very similar thing. It wasn't on the, the Passover moment, but it was this, this kind of thing of cleaning stuff out. But here he comes again, and he, he tries to clear out. Now, I'm sure he doesn't clear out all 16 acres, all right? I'm sure he's just doing what he can in this moment, but it creates this big commotion, and people are running out, and Jesus saying, get out of here. You know, this place that is supposed to be a, you've heard it written, that this place that is supposed to be a house of prayer, and one of the, one of the uh, Mark, as he remembers the story, says, the house of prayer for all people, this open place for everybody, you guys have made it this den of thieves. 
To which they would have said, no, 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 we haven't done that bad, Jesus. What we've done is try to make it easier for the people coming. I mean, if you've had to travel in from the countryside to come for Passover, you've come a long ways, and it wouldn't be fair to expect you to bring your sacrifice, because they need to have a sacrifice for every day they can get something sacrificed. So we're providing a service for the people. And every male over the age of 12 is expected to pay a temple tax. In fact, if you go to a Jewish synagogue even today, there's a temple tax that still exists to this day. In fact, the more tax you pay, the better seats you get. It's a concept I've thought about occasionally. And you couldn't pay the temple tax in just kind of any coin. They didn't want the Roman coins. They needed to have temple money to pay the temple tax. And how do you get temple money? You got to exchange it. So you bring your Roman money and you exchange it for temple money. And somebody's got to do that. And so all we're doing is providing something good for them, Jesus. Apparently Jesus wasn't having it this day. And he runs everybody out of the building out of this space and causes this huge commotion. And there's something that happens after that. But before we get there, let's bow our heads and pray one more time together, all right? Lord, we're looking at this, this remembrance, this story from the life of your son. And in that story, it's filled with commotion. It's filled with emotion. Just like some of us here this morning are. Some of us come with emotions of frustration. Some of us come with sadness. Some of us are even sitting in this room today with a little bit of anger. And for some of us, this week has just been a week of commotion so much stuff and being pulled in so many different directions. And at this moment, we feel much like those sellers. We have so much to get done and we're trying to do a good thing, but maybe it's not in the best way. And for some of us, we just feel a weight. A weight of one of those weeks. And because of that, and because of where I'm at today, Father, I just ask that you would give me some hope today. Give me some courage today. Give me something that I need today that will help not only make this moment better, but this upcoming week better. And if you can do that, I will be here next week with a smile on my face and thankful again to know that you are active and alive and still a part of my life. Amen. So there's the scene. Jesus rushes in. He throws people out. And there's a result that happens from all this. And here's what the result is. The blind and crippled people came to Jesus in the temple, and he healed them. That as Jesus pushes all these, this selling, all this commotion out, it frees up some space for these people to be able to get to Jesus. And as they come, Jesus heals them. Blind people. People who have never seen in their whole life cannot see their fingers. People that haven't been able to hear. Their wife talked for years. They're probably at the end of the line. No, I'm just kidding. But, but you just think of the, the, the moment there, right, of, of, the, of the amazing joy that people have come seeking some hope. And they've come to the temple. They've gotten this place, and Jesus begins to heal them. And, and this incredible scene has a result. In fact, the result is this, that the leading priests and the teachers of the law, that is the scribes, they saw that Jesus was doing these wonderful things. Because they've heard the commotion, they know the 16 acres at some place, news gets around, they come to find out what's going on. They stand there and they watch the scene as these people, people that they would normally exclude because you keep those people away from us. 
They begin to get healed. And I can only imagine what a healed person sounds like. Thank you. Because <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't sound like this. Right? So give me a healed sound for me. On the count of three, everybody give me their best healed sound. One, two, three. Yeah. Right? And you can imagine the kind of noise that echoes off all the walls there in the temple and just the, the sound. And so they've come to see what's going on and they see, witness this thing. Again, people that, that, are, that have been born crippled, people that have injured themselves, that are now back there. And not only do they see these wonderful things, and they also see that the children were praising him in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, which simply means, save now, Son of David. And it's a language that for them meant something so much more than for us. Because the son of David for them was the rescuer. The guy who was going to step in and bring them freedom. Much like Moses did. 1,500 years before. And all these things made the priest and the teachers of the law, the scribes, very angry, indignant. They were worried about the sanctity of this place. And now all the rubble has come in, all those people. And worse, the kids are making all that noise. In fact, it's crazy as I read this story, what the priests say, they ask Jesus, they don't say anything about the healed people. They simply said, do you hear the things these children are saying? I wonder if this is one of those moments that Jesus was like, really? That, that's what you're going to pick up from all this? You know? That lady, that 40-year-old woman who is singing for the very first time in her life? The guy over there that's been hunched over for 20 years? The leper that now has fingers back. And what you're ticked off over is the kids making too much noise. Really? But they asked Jesus, do you hear the things these children are saying? The kids calling out to you as this Messiah figure. And I, and I love Jesus' response. Because it would have been hard to miss the kids, right? Yes. <laughs> kind of duh. I can't miss the kids. They're running around yelling, you know. Hosanna, son of David, you know. Save us, son of David. You know how kids are. They don't do it all in order. They're running around yelling, screaming. They're having a great time because they've been around people who are now seeing. Maybe, maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a, a brother or sister. Whatever the case is, they've seen people get healed, and they're just going crazy. And then Jesus says, haven't you heard, haven't you read in the Scriptures, because he's talking to people who are versed in the Scriptures. Haven't you read in the Scriptures you have taught children and babies to sing praises. Did you guys miss that? Because that was kind of in there one way. In fact, the literal language is this. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared that is created praise. Which I think is crazy. This is not talking about 8-year-olds, 11-year-olds, Six-year-olds, this is talking about one-year-olds and three-year-olds and those precious two-year-olds. He says, don't you know that God has said that's out of their mouth that he's created praise? This joy? And then Jesus leaves. Now, when he leaves, we can only expect what happens. I don't know how long it takes for the, the people to move back into the temple. Or do they wait a couple hours to make sure that Jesus is not coming back, because that's kind of a scary scene. But this is what they do for a living. This is their, their biggest sales time of the year, because this is Passover. And we know that Jesus, again, has done this before, three years before, and everybody's back. So this is not a long-lasting fix. But Jesus is making a point. 
So here's some observations. Sometimes you have to disturb the status quo to get back to what's important. And the problem with disturbing the status quo is even if we don't like it, it's comfortable. Right? I mean, think about your own life. Even if you know stuff's sort of a little out of balance in your life, you know, I, I, I was talking with a couple this week, and they were like, uh, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. We got plans to do this, plans to do that, but life sort of happens, and you really have to make plans for it. And it's Even when we know we need to do something, it's just something. But sometimes, somebody, sometimes you have to disturb the status quo. And Jesus disturbs it on that day. He calls them out. And when he calls them out, he was calling them out on the thing that they said they were so much for, this idea of the sanctity of the temple. And he says, isn't the sanctity of the temple, isn't the whole point of this, that this would be a house of prayer for everybody? And when he says that language, it's not simply a place that everybody would come and pray and nobody would have any discussions. The idea of prayer is just simply this idea of connecting with God, talking to God trying to hear from God, and isn't this what this whole place is supposed to be about? And and I wonder sometimes, I wonder sometimes, if we have missed out on doing what Jesus wants us to do because we have been comfortable with the status quo. Because everybody has a status quo. We have a status quo here at, uh, at New Hope. There's a greater status quo within our denomination around the world. And here's something I, I made up this week. If we want a world where those inclined to abuse their power do it less, more of us have to find the courage to use ours. Because isn't that part of our national discussion? Making our voices heard? Of standing up? of changing things. Second observation. We have a tendency to defend our actions. You know, as I told you last week, this whole week of Jesus' life is not a teaching week. It's not supposed to look at the week and say, oh, I, I feel like Jesus in this moment, or I feel like, you know, one of the disciples in this moment. But there are some connect points. I mean, isn't it true that, that you and I, we, we all have this tendency to defend our actions? And the priests and the scribes, they, they would have defended it again. These people need perfect sacrifices. They can't give an imperfect one, so why not come to somebody that's already been approved? And we'll make it easy for people. They don't have to bring it all the way from their home, wherever they've traveled from. And they got to get their money someplace, and what better place than they get it right here so they can get it and pay their taxes? All so simple and easy. And while we have a tendency to defend our actions, but we all, can't always excuse them. You know, I look at that scene, and what it looks like to me is clutter. Now, it's that time of the year we call a, close to spring, right? And at spring, something happens traditionally and annually for a lot of pla people, a lot of places, and it's called spring cleaning. That's right, right? Because there's a reason we do spring cleaning. Because stuff has just piled up, right? And I don't know about you, have you ever been in one of those situations where you have a mess that is so bad 
you have no idea where to start. You know, you're having a great night of sleep, and it's like 1.30 in the morning, and you hear that lovely sound from your kid's bedroom. Starts with, Ugh, and finishes with, Ugh. You decide who's going to make this march in there, you know, and you go in there. And if one of you gets in there, it's really bad. You call the other one in there, and you get there, and it's just like, well, yeah, where do we begin, right? Maybe your desk looks like my desk. Which, by the way, I know where everything is at on my desk. So do not move anything, because I do know which stack it is and about where it's at in that stack, but at some moment, those stacks get so deep. But it's not just the stuff. It's not just the, you know, the garages we have that are supposed to store our cars, but actually end up storing so much other stuff. It's the clutter, these, this untidy, this disorganized mess. And as you look at that situation, uh, in this 13 acres of, of building, you have to imagine it is just packed with, with people and packed with sellers because how are you going to handle anywhere from 800,000 to a couple million people to get their sacrifices, to get their bills paid, to, you know, their taxes paid, to, to cover all this stuff? It just gets this mess. And the reality is they, that is the priest, had, had cluttered the temple and cluttered people's minds and their faith. They had mixed stuff up. That's what Jesus' issue is at the start. You've mixed all the stuff up, and in the process of mixing up, you've cluttered and you've kept out the people that really ought to be here. And what if that's true? I don't know about you, but there are times I look at my life and I think, what a mess. It is so cluttered with stuff. And I'm not just talking about material stuff. I'm just talking about stuff. How many of you this week did not finish everything you needed to get done this week? Anybody else there with me on that? All right. Anybody actually finish everything they need to get done this week? Stand, stand up, Colleen. Stand up. Man. We had a, yeah. Woo. Gives us hope. Out of 400 people, one of us made it. Woo! You need to tell us how it is on the other side, right? You know, yeah. But I mean, you think about it. I mean, I, we have that. And, and some of that's important stuff. You know, some of that's just stuff stuff. How many of you not finished your taxes yet? Man, I feel much better. Thank you, Hill. Thank you. I'll ask that in about a month, and we'll find out how we're doing, right? But... But, you know, it's something that's got to get done, but it's not kind of urgent yet. And then, you know, you maybe got lights. How many of you got lights on your cars? Any of those, you know, they used to call them idiot lights. Now they call them warning lights to make us feel better. Uh, a couple of us have those, you know, and it's, it's, they're there. And the car's still running, so let's not worry about it right away. We got a couple more days, right? But you're going to think of all the stuff that begins to build up and how do you fit all the time in. And do you ever feel like life just has gotten so, so cluttered? And it's not because it's all bad stuff. It is just where it has gotten to. And sometimes it is just a phase of life. And you know it's a phase of life. And you know, hey, we got to get through this. We got to, you know, it's just going to be for this amount of period. And you can buckle down and make it through. The challenge always is, is that when it becomes not just a phase of life, but it becomes just life. We have our defenses of it. But even we know that our excuses don't always hold up to what we're trying to do and why we can't do it and how we can't do it and when we can't do it. And if your life is like mine, Sometimes you need some outside help. In fact, we had somebody do that this week for not my office. Sadly, she didn't make it back to my office. She worked on another one of our offices this week. But she volunteered to help make it look better. Because sometimes you just have no idea where to start. I mean, I, I go around my office. I, I start here, and I move everything to this side so I can start here. 
And then I get it down. I still have one big stack on my desk, but I have everything else in the room looks pretty good. But this one stack that I moved everything to is just, it's the time and the energy. And sometimes we just need somebody to come along who can step in, that can re re reorganize things for us, that can just clean things up. And the great news, the great news of the story is this. See, we can look at this story and say, man, Jesus is ticked off and he's mad and he's coming in and he's cleaning up this clutter. And... But what if it isn't he would just, he isn't mad at the clutter and all this stuff. He's just upset that we've let so much stuff build up that it's prevented really the best stuff of getting through. I mean, he knows people need the offerings. He knows that people have to exchange money somehow. It's just issue is, is this the right spot for it? And is it being done in the best way? And maybe more importantly, is it taking up space that ought to be occupied by the people who need to be in that spot? And maybe for all of us, it's to remember that Jesus is always always trying to work on the clutter in our lives. He's always trying to break through that stuff. Simply because he wants to make space in your life and in my life. Space where we can breathe, where we can have a moment where it's not just packed in with stuff. A moment where maybe, just maybe, we can get to him and experience the healing that he wants us to experience. So let me ask you a couple of what-if questions as we wrap this up today. What if the key to uncluttering our life really is as simple as letting Jesus step in? Because let's be honest, there are some of us in this room that know that would be true, but we have kind of kept Jesus at arm distance. We've told Jesus what I tell everybody about my desk. It's okay. I got a handle on it. It's okay. I know where everything's at. It's okay that it looks so bad. What if? What if the key really is letting Jesus step in and let him push the stuff back. And what if, what if we began looking each day, looking for God praises around us? What if we begin each day, we began where those kids were at? Kind of just an abandoned wonder. You know, where kids just spontaneously sing, they spontaneously laugh, they spontaneously are aware of things that we have seen so often that we don't recognize anymore. What if we opened our, idea, our eyes up to more of the ideas of how God's in and around us in literally everything? And what if, what if we didn't assume our voices can't make a difference? What if we didn't look at the status quo and say, well, what can I do? And what if we began each day believing we can change the world for those around us? Because you can do all those things. I can do all those things. I could say yes to Jesus. Do what you need to do because it's, I have no idea where to start. I can look around and say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for them, for them, for them, for them, for them, for that, for that, for that. What if I began to notice those things? And what if we took more seriously the power of our voices together 
and speaking out for those that are less. The lame, the crippled, the blind, both physically, spiritually, maybe societally. And what if this week we made life better just for one person other than ourselves? Would that be end up being a good week? Jesus stepped in on that Monday. He cleans out that temple, or at least that section of it. He opens up space for people to come and get what they really need, this idea of a healing life, of, of wholeness and life back. He hears kids running around, babies, saying, Hosanna, blessed is it he who come in the name of the Lord, you know? And sometimes he needs to tell us, really? You're worked up over that? And you're not praising God for this other? See, while we can, the biggest question is simply this. And only you can answer that.